Hello Riverside. It's good to be with you here today virtually. I would love if you would pray with me. We're going to open the Word of God together and see what He's got for us this Memorial Day weekend. We pray. Father, thank you so much for your written Word, your, your Word revealed to us, the person of Christ revealed to us through these people you chose to use to communicate to us, to people. God, we're so thankful for that. We pray that you would just uh, open our eyes and ears to, to see and to hear what you have for us in it, that your spirit would prepare our hearts, that you would make the ground fertile to take that in and to be affected by it. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. I like to think that I am pretty good at looking at a situation and determining what is wrong in this situation. Do you relate to that at all? My daughter was jogging this week and she displayed a good set of skill here. As she got on this one little stretch of road, she noticed that there were a larger number of people than usual and everybody seemed to be acting super normal until she noticed all their earpieces and then ran past a white van pulled over to the curb. And as she looked into the window, she noticed people on laptops there and that triggered her. Something's wrong with this picture instinct. And she ran quickly home and told us and hoped that she had not been part of some federal investigation. So I've got a little game for you today to figure out if you're good at knowing what's wrong with this picture. I have some pictures. I'm going to show you one and I want you to tell me what's wrong. Be bold. Say it out loud. If you're with people, pronounce it. If you are alone, say it out loud and make your neighbors wonder what's wrong with you or type it into the comments if you don't actually want to say it out loud. I will go a little slower than I did the last time we played a game. Are you ready? Ready? This first one, you just need to look a minute and decide what's wrong. There are shadows, there are footprints. Don't say that we didn't really land there. That flag is realistic for what, but there's something wrong. Do you see it yet? Have you noticed that what it might be? Okay, next one. Think about it. Things seem right. This makes sense, but something's off. Do you see it? It's yellow and red. That's right. Burger. But something's not right. You got it? Okay, how about this? It's a little more subjective. Um, maybe he just likes shorts. But if you look, he, he seems he has strangely nice legs for a dude, right? Got it? Yeah. What is that? Oh, I thought I heard it. A mirror, you say? <laughs> Here's another one. This is one of my favorites. It's just something really strange that happens when the shirts are the same color in the photos. That one is up there with this one for me with the Tootsie dog and also a slightly more scandalous one that's really funny. It's just funny if you think about what you're seeing there. Occasionally something truly advanced comes along, something that can challenge your ability to know what's wrong with this picture. So you want to try out your hand on an advanced one? We'll go double or nothing. Wait, what's that? Oh, no, 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 I definitely don't encourage gambling. Um, here you go. What's wrong with this picture? Hmm. It's easy to, to struggle here. I know that it's hard to find anything wrong, but I, I want to point out to you that I think the real problem is this is clearly a, uh, a race sheet from a horse track. She's got a gambling problem in case that wasn't obvious. That's what's wrong. When I first started following Jesus, um, when I was a new Christian, I thought a big part of my job was figuring out what was wrong and then pointing it out for other people, like assuming that she had a problem. I remember at a high school party, this is the end of our senior year, our choir had the party, all of our tech people, the band that was part of that. It was a bunch of us out at a park and my teacher asked me to pray for our meal because we were off site and we could do that and I, I was excited so I did and I don't remember exactly what I said but I said something like dear God please give us wisdom that's good right that was a good start and then I said don't let the people here continue to live as they have been 
ignoring you and your desire. Please, God, convict them of sin and save them. Now, I remember parts of the prayer because of the look my friend gave me. He was the one who introduced me to the youth pastor, and the two of them were the ones who led me to turn my life to Jesus. He said that I did that prayer badly. It's obvious now, but at the time it made perfect sense to me. Apparently, pointing out what was wrong was not my job, at least not like that. Not by shaming everyone publicly or communicating just what I disliked. So what went wrong in me? How did, how did I misread that so badly? Well, I did not properly understand my part. I was growing, but I was immature. I was a spiritual child. I needed a mentor, a spiritual parent to, to coach me, to teach me, to guide me. My friend was a little more mature than I was, but I needed an adult, someone who'd been walking with Jesus, a spiritual adult, someone who could explain to me my part and who understood their own part. Um, it could help me understand God's part in the life of other people. I needed a mature disciple. We've been talking about this word for several weeks and, and kind of demystifying. It sounds intimidating, but it just means a student or a follower of Jesus. I needed one of these who had grown enough, not just a, a mere young adult anymore, but one who was ready to help a child like me, a spiritual parent. We've been walking through this way that we tend to grow, and it doesn't mean you don't move around. You'll find yourself going up and down. It's just once you move from death to life, you don't ever cross that line again. But then you grow through infancy and childhood and young adulthood into a place where you're a mature believer who's ready to coach an immature one. If you got a Bible with you, uh, open it. If you don't have a Bible with you, go get a Bible. We're going to read that thing. You can download them free off the internet. We're going to be in the back part, the second half, the part that chronicles the coming of Jesus and then what happened because of that. And if you go through the first few books, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans, you'll get to uh, this book, 1 Corinthians, the first letter we have to the church at Corinth written through the Apostle Paul, guided by the Holy Spirit. We're going to look at this passage outside its context. Now, context is a way of describing what was happening when it was written originally, what was going on, and what did it mean to that original audience. And a giant rule of thumb when you are reading the Bible is taking a verse out of context is not cool. That's how lots of errors and bad teachings start. For example, you will hear people in TV shows say the truth will set you free. Well, that's not what the Bible says. Jesus said, if you abide in my word, you are my disciples. Then you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. Free. The context is really important. Don't study the Bible without context. So what we have to do when we go to a passage like this is we look at it and recognize its context, but sometimes inside its context, it can answer a question that we may have. It may be able to answer other questions. For example, uh, one time Jesus was asked in Matthew chapter 12 of the book of Matthew, they, people asked him for a sign to show that he really is, that it really was going to happen. And Jesus said, you get no sign except the sign of Jonah. And then he describes it. And Jonah was three days and nights in the belly of a fish. So also the Son of Man will be three days and nights in the belly of the earth. That was the context. But when you go to that passage, it also can answer some other questions. One of the questions I have when I go to that passage is, did Jesus believe that Jonah was a real story. And this is one of the places in your New Testament where you find out, yes, he did. You, you find other places where many of the things of the Old Testament are referred to, and we find that Jesus believed they were real. That helps me when I go to the Old Testament because I know that Jesus said, those things are real. Those aren't just stories. That happened. It's helpful. Context. 1 Corinthians 4, 14 to 16. In this passage, Paul's frustrated. There's a church in Corinth that he 
planted. He taught them who Jesus was as he came through on a mission journey. And that church listens to every random teaching and they even look down on the apostles. They think of themselves as successful and smart and better than all these apostles who live with such sacrifice and give up so much to share the gospel and they chase after these immature teachers. And as Paul rebukes them, he answers a question we have. And that question is this, what's the relationship between spiritual parent and and child because that's what Paul was to them he taught them who Jesus was he started the church there he's like a parent or a father to them spiritually not just because he's one of the Apostles one of the messengers that were used to write the scriptures but simply because he helped with their new birth in Christ he planted that seed he helped them come to new life in Christ so how does that relationship work? We get an example of it here in this passage. So let's read it and we'll see that. We'll start at verse 14. I do not write, this is, remember he was frustrated and now he's explaining. I do not write these things to make you ashamed, but to admonish you as my beloved children. For though you have countless guides in Christ, you do not have many fathers. For I became your father in Christ Jesus through the gospel, I urge you then, be imitators of me. It's intimidating, but we'll get there in a moment. There's this guy on YouTube. His name is Rob Kenny. When Rob was 12 years old, his dad walked out on him and his seven brothers and sisters. Understandably, his mom didn't handle that well and turned to alcohol in a fairly severe way. So by the time Rob was 14, he moved in to the mobile home of his newly married big brother. Life was complicated for Rob. His mom had taught him that God was keeping score in his life, that he got a tick mark for every bad thing he did. But when he did a good thing, he could erase them one at a time. That was this giant burden of guilt over his head as he grew up. Years later, Rob found out that God wasn't like that. He found out that Jesus was the hero. That led him to build a desire to raise good adults, not raise kids, to raise adults, to prepare them for life. And now he's done that. And in the midst of this quarantine, he realizes he has the time on his hands to do something he'd wanted to do for quite a while. He started a YouTube channel to address part of what he missed in his shattered childhood. He calls it, Dad, how do I? Like that. He's using it to help be a dad to kids who didn't have one around like himself. He started back in April. One of his first videos was how to shave your face. And as one who has shaved recently, that's important advice. It's not quite as instinctual as you would think. Rob's already at a million subscribers. He just started in April. We need, we need dads. We need help with this relationship. Many of our own fathers, many of your own fathers weren't around or they hurt you. Well, Rob reconciled with him in recent years and got to forgive him. Not all get to do that. Some of us were blessed with dads who told us they loved us. That is a bigger gift than you know, dads. And it's important. What Paul did in these three verses is demonstrate two things that his spiritual children need. And he will also show two things that a spiritual parent should be, or at least a picture of a healthy one like Paul. We see him as an example in this passage. Within the context of writing to people whom he had led to Jesus, he's also giving examples of how to be a spiritual dad. So you may want to make a list. My list looked like this. The child needs to be, there's going to be two things, and the parent needs to be, and there's going to be two things. There's room for some ideas in there. This is an example of a healthy relationship between a spiritual parent or coach and a child or student 
Now, the first two are in the first verse right there in 14. I don't write to make you ashamed, but to admonish. He, he, ashamed and admonished. His earlier correction, if you go to the verses above, it was pretty direct, but he qualifies it here. He's not trying to shame them, but he is clearly admonishing them. Write that down. Ashamed. I'm sorry, not ashamed, but admonished. Admonished, not ashamed, not shamed. Have you ever been admonished? Have you ever used the word admonish? Yeah, I'm thinking that's less than 20% of you raising hands there. Uh, it's not a word we use very often, but it captures this one well. It, it means to instruct or to warn. It's used to direct someone away from a harmful course. You may have never used that word, but I'm betting you've done that part, that you've warned someone. How about this word? Shame. You ever shame anyone? It happens easier than we wish, right? You mean to admonish, just to warn them, to make sure they, they know that there's danger, but in your effort to make sure that they heard you, you started with shame. In my house, it sounds like this. I don't even understand how you don't already know better. At least that's what it sounded like when I said it on Monday night. So many of you with wounds from your dads, it, it came from this. It started with words like, what were you thinking? Or how could you even? Do you remember the first time you felt shame? I don't know if I can remember my very first, but one of my earliest, um, I grew up playing with BB guns, like the little toy that shot the tiny metal ball that would put your eye out. I had one when I was seven years old and I knew what I was allowed to shoot and what I must never shoot or even point at. But one day my aunt's nephews from Atlanta were in town and they were so cool. I loved it when they came. I always, I just wanted to be like them. And so we walked to the old tobacco barn in the back field and there was a small room in that barn that had a little pot-bellied stove. They used that room to grade or to rate the tobacco at the end of the tobacco season and it had two little glass windows well when i made this the window pointed at that thing but i don't know what i'm doing wrong to make it look like it's the field but let's pretend that my arrow points at this little window and there was another one around on that other side peggy thinks this is very funny but we're going to keep going um, it was unusual for a barn to have a nice glass window like that. One of my friends took the BB gun and he said, I wonder what it would do to that glass in that window. And then he fired it at it and it didn't shatter. Instead of shattering, it left a perfect little hole right through the glass. And I got to admit that that was a surprise. That was kind of remarkable. And then his brother took the BB gun and he took a turn and then they handed it to me. When there's guilt to be had, you need to make sure everybody's complicit, right? I was scared. I, I didn't want to break my uncle's barn window. And I was shaking so badly when I fired it. I was right up next to it. When I fired it, I hit the window with the barrel and it broke out a much larger hole. And then I felt it. Nobody made me feel it. Nobody shamed me. But I was ashamed. My uncle was one of my favorite people. My dad had taught me right and wrong. I knew this was wrong and I was ashamed. I tried to ignore it, I couldn't ignore it. Eventually the pain inside me was way worse than my fear of the consequences and I went and I confessed. Now childhood shame is powerful, but the adult shame is completely different, isn't it? It's not the same as I put a hole in your window, right? When your friend approaches and says, I've heard some rumors, are these things true? Or when you've made a decision and the regret is deep, when it's embarrassing, it's humiliating, when there's sin or you just, oh, your hands are dirty. It was not Paul's intention to shame them. We tend to do that to ourselves. His goal was to warn, to admonish, to correct, to protect them. My friend Jonathan says he was calling them up, not out. 
Why was he doing that? Why was it not his goal to shame them, but to warn, to correct them? Well, he says it because he loved them. They're beloved children. He loves these people. He's interested and invested in their lives. He's not some distant spectator making observations about what's wrong with that picture. He loves them. Write that one. They're beloved, not a burden. That's worth writing down. That's important for the child to know. You ever felt like a burden or a project or a duty? If you reduce the gospel to a chore we have to share, that reduces people to a burden we have to bear. I think that's worth repeating. You can rewind and repeat on your own. I'm also going to repeat it. If you reduce the gospel to a chore we have to share, a duty just because these people we have no choice, that reduces people to a burden that we have to bear. That kind of gospel's not really the whole gospel, is it? If you remove love from the gospel, you've kind of lost the plot. It's kind of the point. Paul admonishes them because he cares about them. He's concerned for their behavior. Sin's not bad just because it's bad. It's not some arbitrary thing. Sin is deadly. Sin's an offense to God. If you actually love people in your life, wouldn't it bother you if they were in sin? This is complicated, isn't it? Some of you have family, you have friends who are in sin. If they don't know Jesus, you can't expect them to follow Him. If they do know Jesus and they reject your warning or they start to avoid you, it gets complicated. If you just ignore it, are you being loving? But if you bring it up at every meal, are you loving? Is that more about you than about them? Part of the journey from child to adult is hearing wisdom and then making our own decisions. You'll have to find ways to separate areas where you disagree or where they refuse to hear. You have to separate that from your ongoing love and then trust that the Holy Spirit will bring conviction when He's ready. That's His job. Some of the big culturally sensitive areas when we talk about sin, we get stuck. It makes, makes me nervous bringing it up, but you think about this, and I know some of you have struggled with it. If your son is sexually active with a man, or your sister's pursuing marriage with a woman, or you've got a friend struggling with a gay attraction, when it's about sex, we think that we can't love our friends unless we make our views clear all the time. Do we do that with other things that we believe are sin? If your bro drinks too much or he makes racist jokes, do you quit attending his soccer games? Do you cut him off? If your daughter's arrogant, do you disown her? If you're here and you disagree with me, can we remain friends? I know a couple who lead a church in the Arts District in uh, Dallas. They were invited into a seminary class to talk about their model in that community and how they serve that community. And a student asked them, well, what they call all those lost people? And they paused because the question confused them. And then they said to the class, friends. The, the people in Paul's life were not a burden to him. They're not something he tolerated. They were beloved, agape, that's the word that's used. They were agape, he loved them. The spiritual kids in your life, they need to know that, that you love them. You can just text that out of the blue now and then, it's completely okay. Just need you to know, I was thinking about you, want you to know I love you. I did that when I wrote this on Wednesday to a friend I haven't talked to recently. It helps when you realize that this is your part. The child needs to be admonished, not ashamed, beloved, not a burden. Then it's up to them to do their part with that. This is how I'm to treat them. And then they have to do their own part. And then it's up to God to do His part. You can't convict or save. That's His. It's just His. 
You can love and admonish. That's yours. To do that well, there were a couple of things that were true in Paul's life. We see it in verse 15. He told them they had countless guides. They had uh, the word there is pedagogos. It's the Greek root for the word pedagogy or pedagogy in English. Teachers, in other words. And some of those teachers weren't bad. Uh, you read the earlier passage, but a lot of them were bad and they were getting gobs of information. There was plenty of information. There always is plenty of information. Sometimes I get questions from you guys and the difficulty isn't that you don't have any ideas, it's that there's so much confusing information out there, you're not sure which, which site to trust or which people to trust. The same thing for them. They had access to information. What they needed was a dad. They needed a dad. They needed someone who loved them, who was ahead of them spiritually, who could guide them to good data, to good information, trustworthy answers. The, the parent needs to be a dad, not data, not just information, not, not just a source that you could substitute with the internet. A dad, invested. Escribe, write that. A dad, not data. Dads often have information, at least this is the way we think about them. There's a meme on the internet right now about this symbol and it comes with the question, do you know what this is? And the funny answer floating around on the internet means it's time to call my dad. That's what that symbol means. Uh, it's easy to look up answers, but when people are hurting they don't want answers, they want dad. They want mom. It's more important to have someone to turn to than to know what to do. Think about that. That's true for most of us most of the time. It's more important to have someone you can turn to than it is to know the answer. Those of you who've been walking with Jesus for a while, it's time to invest in some who just barely know him, who don't know him very well. Because when the spit, spit has hit the fan, they need spiritual parents, wiser Christians, adult, mature Christians. Not all, um, not all together, not people who have it all together, but ones who know Jesus, who can be there, ones who can show them what to do. Look, I urge you then, be imitators of me. This always bothered me. Who am I that someone should imitate me? They may get all my mistakes and shortcomings and failings. I was talking to some of our teachers earlier this week and one mentioned cooking and she said, when we teach somebody to cook, we say, watch what I do. And it's not intimidating at all. This is how we learn. We do this in almost every area of life. You golfers, you say, here, hold it like this. You doctors, you say, move it like so, you mechanics, you say torque it like I am on your side over there. I was a carpenter through the end of college and for a while after and even sometimes still. And my first day on the job, my boss said, can you use a circular saw? And I thought that was really good. It was good. He didn't say, have you ever used one? He said, can you? And I said, yes, I can. And so he sent me out to cut a piece of plywood. And when I brought it back to him, the horribly crooked line I had cut made it clear I was not proficient with a chainsaw or a circular saw at all. It looked like a chainsaw. And he screamed out, I'm never going to financially recover from this. No, that, that's not what he did. He paused. He looked at me and he said, this doesn't look quite like what we will need. Are you any good with a circular saw? And I said, no, you asked me if I could use one. And I thought technically I could do it. And then he took me over to the saw horses and he said, the great thing about wood is you can always cut another piece. Watch me. And then he said, now you do it. Paul says, watch me. Now you do what I do. That's how we learn. The child needs you to be a disciple, not a diva. You're one who's being changed by Jesus, following Jesus, on mission with Jesus, a disciple. Not some distant diva who thinks you're above all this. Not some ivory tower believer who stopped loving immature people long ago. You are in on this journey too. 
They need to see that in you. Wendy and I uh, served in student ministry back in Tennessee for nine years. And then we moved to Texas and I served for five more in student ministry. And all of those years, we watched the parents of these teenagers. And we were always trying to figure out what's the secret ingredient to your kids coming out healthy for them to love Jesus, to raise godly adults. And what we learned is that there weren't any. There wasn't one method. There were many different paths and personalities of those families. However, we noticed that the kids who did all right, the ones who navigated the distant years well, there were usually two things that were true in their homes, whether they had a single parent or married parents or with a guardian. The first one, they could ask honest questions. That was almost always true. Mom, dad, guardian, grandma, whoever was approachable and didn't get angered by real questions. They wanted them to come to them with the questions. And the second thing that was almost always true is the parents needed Jesus. I got it. Everybody needs Jesus. I get that. But in these homes, mom and dad knew that they needed Jesus. And when mistakes were made, dad would say, I've been talking to God about what happened earlier and I am sorry for what I said. I'm sorry for what I did. Her mom would say, I have an interview coming up and I'm nervous. Will you pray with me? They were able then to imitate their parents because they saw their parents living out a real relationship with Jesus. Mom and dad needed Jesus too. They were on the same journey. They were just further ahead. Their parents or their parent or their guardian lived it out in front of them. Not a show where you make a production out of your prayers, but intentional enough that your kid knows what you're doing when you sit quietly on your knees in the morning. That they know that you're praying. Not to impress them, but to say, hey, give me just a minute. Johnny, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm just talking to God for a second. Or when you sit outside with that book, you actually let them know it's a Bible and you do that on a regular basis. They need to see it and it has to be real. Not real in terms of fake it till you make it, but real in terms of honest. You're talking about your own growth and struggles because if you're playing the role of a spiritual parent, you are the one they will learn it from whether you like it or not. And if you're struggling, well, what better thing than to ask them to pray with you or for you and walk alongside you. It's easy to be on this journey and think that your task is to point out everything that's wrong. It's not. Your task is simpler. The child needs to be admonished and not shamed, beloved and not a burden. And you're growing to be a parent, not just information. Hey, a disciple, not someone who no longer needs Jesus. One of the ladies who was a spiritual parent to my wife, she used to say, if you lead a person to Jesus and then abandon them, that's spiritual child neglect. Paul was a father to this church. He was also a father to Timothy and Titus and Onesimus. He didn't do that all at once. It happened over years of life. I encourage you. I admonish you. Seek out a spiritual parent. Call them a coach if that makes it more comfortable. Parents, seek out non-believers or young believers. We need each other. We've got an interview in just a moment of some people walking through this now. And then we're going to close with a song that I think you're really going to like. Before we do that, will you let me pray? Father, I am so grateful for the way you use this imagery throughout your word to help us understand first our relationship with you, but also how we walk it out with others. And God, I'm so grateful for those in my life who were spiritual parents to me, who listened to my questions, who took my inappropriate phone calls, who were there when I needed them to guide me and walk with me. And I'm so grateful for that, Father. I pray that you would raise us up to be that in the lives of other people so that they would be beloved and admonished, not ashamed. Thank you for Jesus in his name. Amen. I will see you soon.
Hey, Riverside Church, uh, we are uh, back today with another interview. I want to uh, introduce you guys um, to Tom Case. Uh, we're going to get to talk to him a little bit about uh, what has discipleship looked like uh, throughout his life as he's gotten poured into by uh, some uh, men and then as he's been able to pour into some men uh, who are coming after him. So Tom, thanks for being on this. Thanks for uh, having a conversation uh, with us and helping us see into your life. Um, I'd love well, for you maybe to start, just give us a brief introduction for those that might not know you, and then kind of maybe weave into how you came to know Jesus in your, in your walk. Okay, Matt, thank you. Uh, it's mighty nice to be with you. You know, I, uh, I probably start out for the longest time and was going to be a professional golfer. Grew up in a golfing family in North Carolina, went to Wake Forest University on a golf scholarship, uh, played four years there and um, really had no interest in the things of faith. I, I always knew that what I heard in the small Quaker church I grew up in about Jesus Christ was true. I never doubted that for a moment. I just didn't want any part of it. Uh, I was busy trying to win trophies and, and uh, having a big time in college. And then I got out of school and I moved to Florida and I knew it was true. I just kept fighting it. And then one day, in 1977, I, I was not in a church, but sitting in a classroom. And I really, I know theologically what happened, but experientially I was sitting in a classroom chair and I just said, you know, Jesus, I'm through fighting you. I don't really know what this means. I have no idea what happens going forward, but to the best of my ability, from now on, I'm going to follow you. And my life changed. My life really changed that day in that classroom. Uh, so that was 43 years ago. And uh, along the way, I've been really fortunate. I had some, I early on had some men that had time for me. Uh, one man in particular uh, in 1987. So I'd been a believer 10 years. I nearly quit work to go to seminary and got so interested in studying the Bible that I, I would meet with this gentleman who was very well read very knowledgeable and asked questions of him and we'd have lunch that would start at 11 30 and go until they started to serve dinner and uh he was wonderful for me i would ask him a question and he would hardly ever mad he would hardly ever answer the question he'd take my bible turn it upside down point at something and say now read that and this went on for a long time so he really poured himself into me and then I was very fortunate uh, not long after that to get to know Dr. R.C. Sproul, uh, Presbyterian theologian. Uh, I played some golf with him, got to know him a little and studied what he did. And he was terrific, not only with the, the media, but even personally. So I had some guys that were took an interest and were great. A little time passed. And uh, as I got older, um, the good Lord started putting young men in my life and people that would, I'd never asked, but people would ask me. And um, suddenly I'd find myself in a situation of encouraging someone to consider Jesus Christ or even uh, having the privilege of, of leading someone to Christ. Uh, and never, and I've never had a, 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 an original thought. I mean, the, the one thing, Matt, and I'll, I'll end this part with this, the one thing that maybe I have done uh, to his credit well with is that if the good Lord nudges me and I know it's happening, uh, I don't wait. I, uh, if I know it's him, I don't procrastinate because I might find a reason not to do what I think it is. And so uh, along the way, he's put things in front. I made myself available. He's put things there. And, and that's, that's kind of the, that's the story on, on Tom case. Uh, long story made a little shorter. That's awesome. So, I mean, you, know, you, you talked a lot about, I know in, in my own life, I can think about those, you know, those two or three guys that kind of poured into me. And so that's cool to kind of hear that for you as you've been able to pour into some, some younger guys now um, on the, on the back end of, after knowing Christ, walking with them for many years, I know that you have, have now used that platform of golf. And so kind of talk to us a little bit about how you've kind of meshed golf. Uh, you love the game, always grew up loving the game. And then this, this discipleship stuff with some younger men, how, how has that kind of clashed together for you? Hmm. That's a good question. Um, 
w w with the golf, it really it really comes down to being willing to talk to someone when the opportunity presents itself because the opportunities are, are there everywhere and and you don't need to uh to force the situation not long ago I, I had conversation two or three times with some friends about how do you evangelize in the locker room well you don't you don't you but you make yourself available and when people hit spots or when they get a nudge they'll say something to you and then you got to be available you got to be willing and and you know, Lord, if you put him in my path, I'll talk to him. And so uh, um, I tell guys, look, it'll happen. If you just say to the good Lord, hey, you, you, you tap me on the shoulder, I'm here. He will do it. He will do it. And, uh, and that's what's happened. I've used golf. I've used business. Uh, great young friend that uh, came to Christ and then asked me to be involved in marriage vows beyond uh, the time that, because when he got married the first time, he was not a believer. And those things are such a privilege for an older person, you know, to watch the good Lord take hold of someone's life and how it changes, which it really, if he, if he gets you, you're going to change and you're not going to sit still. Uh -huh. So that, that's just been a real privilege. And so, you know, I know that we were talking a little bit ago about just the, it's called JPT. Can you kind of give us a glimpse into what that is for those that don't know and kind of how you've been able to kind of steward the influence uh, that you've gained, the, the relationships that you've met all across the country? How have you used that and brought that together uh, to benefit some men that can go out and then influence for the gospel? Yeah, great, great question. Uh, JPT is... Uh, those are initials for a First Thessalonians verse. Uh, Rejoice always, joy. Pray without ceasing. T, T, in all things give thanks. And I love this next line. For this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. And so we started this uh, retreat at Pine Valley Golf Club in New Jersey that became JPT. That's another story. And the idea behind this was to bring together men of influence that could go back home. It's that iron sharpens iron idea, and then really have an impact with their families and in their businesses and in their communities, because a lot of very successful people don't have people to talk to. Somebody always wants something from them. Yep. They have a target on their back. So we tried to create a safe environment that was fun around golf, where those types of men could come together and then go home energized to have an impact. So that's now 15 years old. And uh, last year we had 70 men in Austin, Texas. We had a meeting in Wilmington, North Carolina. We had one in Dallas, Texas. It would have been four this year without the virus. But, uh, but that's the idea. We had people come to faith in Jesus Christ at that um, meeting but it's really something that's designed to strengthen people that are already of faith to go home and have an impact. It's awesome to see you not only, you know, use your hobby, your faith in Jesus, but the, the relationships that you've built over a lifetime to kind of bring people together and, and create spots where they can kind of, like you said, you know, they can have a healthy, um, safe place that they can then be refreshed to go back and to lead in their context. Um, it, it's awesome uh, to see you doing that and using your gifting. I want to talk a little bit, um, we're in the middle of COVID, and so everybody's world has changed. Um, we're a lot more online, we're Zoom calls, that's why we're doing this on Zoom now. How have you been able to kind of use technology? How have you seen that um, help hinder or help uh, you reach others uh, for Jesus? That's been a game changer, a real game changer. I... Uh... I became friends at the last JPT with a, a gentleman in Dallas, Texas named John Wilbanks, a person who I immediately uh, felt a bond with, just my same age, very good player. And I learned that the last 18 years of Byron Nelson's life, Byron Nelson is one of the greatest golfers that ever played golf, that he sat in John Wilbanks' Sunday school class. So I got interested in knowing more about that in December, November or December, I asked John if he would lead a study of James using Zoom technology. 
and about 30 or 35 people once a week would gather using Zoom all across the country to listen to John Wilbanks teach James. That, that was impossible before the technology because to find a guy of that caliber in our location is it, hard to do. And yet, just as intimate as it could be sitting there looking at him, he sat and talked James to us. It, it was so terrific. And then same thing with technology a little later. I I'd mentioned to you, I got enamored with an author named Mark Batterson. And uh, In a Pit with a Lion on a Snowy Day is a book for young believers uh, that'll make them bold in what they do. And so we put together a Zoom Bible study for five weeks. A friend of mine in Dallas helped lead this, helped quarterback it. We had about 15, 30, 32, 38 year old young men that had come to faith in Christ on this book study. I mean, the technology, it's incredible what you can do with technology. Couldn't have done that before something like Zoom. Very, very exciting. Yeah. Very exciting. That's awesome. I think it. I think it is a really cool time for the church in general. We've talked a lot as a staff about man, the cool things. We launched an online campus in the middle of COVID. You know, who who would have thought that? And so I think it's cool to to see you pressing into that and not kind of letting it be a hindrance, but but pressing into it. As we as we kind of wrap up our time today, last kind of question: um, If if people are watching this, um, they're retired or they're um, seasoned in age. Um, what would your advice be to them? I, I know I've heard people on both sides say, man, I, I wonder if people really care what I have to say, or maybe on the other side, I, I feel like I, I've kind of done my time um, and, and passing it out. What would you say to kind of encourage them to, to get in the game um, at their age? Well, so I'm 68 years old. I'll be 69 in September. The last few years have been the most rewarding years for me ever. Uh, as it would relate to my involvement in, in the Christian walk with, with uh, Christ in the Christian faith. Um, yeah, you've got things to say to young people, but they're only going to hear them if you're genuinely interested in them. You know, if, 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 you, if you care about that young person and will take the time to listen, they will absolutely want to know what you've got to say. And if what you've got to say is if, I love selling Jesus Christ as a product because there's no, there's no flaw in the product. I mean, I, it won't fail. And so it's just a very exciting time um, to be able to be, and I love being around young people. I love the, it, it's just, uh, there's so much energy. Um, I love turning on, I love seeing young people come to Christ. I, it, it's so, I think it's such an exciting time in America in the churches. We got these old dead churches that nobody wants to go to, and yet we got these young, vibrant churches that are that are that are it, the worship service is enthusiastic and it's exciting and it's fun to be there and it's it's the way it should have always been. So uh, I would just encourage other people that have got some wrinkles and very little hair that uh, those young people want to hear from you. If, if you take a if you take a a genuine interest, they absolutely. We'll, we'll, uh, we'll want to have that conversation. Yeah, I know uh, for me, as I've led our college uh, ministry over the past couple of years, um, I, I've always felt like kind of the fear that I hear is the same. The older generation I hear, well, I don't know that they're going to care what I have to say. And the younger generation actually has the same fear of like, I don't know that they're going to care about what I have to say. And so it's, it's cool to hear you say, I think it goes back to you know, they don't care how much you know until they know how much you care, right? And so yeah. just getting together in the same room, I, I, I believe my generation desperately needs your generation. Your generation desperately needs mine. I think there's a beautiful exchange that can happen there. And it's cool to see you uh, steward your life towards that. Um, I love yeah. hearing that the last couple of years of your life are, have been the most rewarding. I think that's um, totally possible and what the Lord, you know, as we age and as we go further into this journey with Jesus. I hope it gets more and more rewarding. So it will. So it thank will. you. Thank you for, uh, for sharing with us. Thank you for stewarding your life uh, for the gospel and living this stuff out um, and, and inspiring us today. Appreciate you. Okay, Matt. Thanks. Nice. Nice to talk with you.